I would like to start our seminar. This time it's uh, one of the uh, lectures of the uh, Fred Jelinek series. And I'm very happy to welcome here Professor Roberto Navelli from Sapienza University, Rome. And I would like to ask Jan Hayic to introduce Professor Navelli. Okay, thank you. Uh, so good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, I'm also very glad to have uh, Roberto here. Uh, is uh, as you probably know, uh, Roberto Navili is a uh, full professor of computer science at the uh, Sapienza University, as Eva has said. He's uh, the leader of the Sapienza NLP group. He's probably most uh, well known and famous for the Babelnet uh, project, um, a, a project which has been. Uh, highlighted in, uh, in uh, for example, in the, in, uh, the Time magazine. And, and also he's the winner of uh, several prizes, uh, most notably at the Artificial Intelligence Journal uh, Prize. And also he's the holder of two uh, consecutive ERC grants. Uh, and one of them you see on the slide. Uh, and uh, also the, the previous one was on Wardsen's uh, disambiguation. And he's also pioneering uh, the use of uh, language resources and NLP technology in the commercial world. So he's the uh, founder, co-founder of Babelscape, a company that uh, enables natural language uh, processing and natural language understanding in actually many languages. So uh, the, 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 the important feature of Babelnet is it's uh, massively multilingual. And I hope uh, uh, he, will, he will talk about this and other things uh, in, uh, in his talk. Uh, also, I should say uh, that uh, looking to the future, he is uh, the, the program chair of ACL, actually ACL uh, IJSC NLP, uh, the Asian uh, ACL next year. Uh, so uh, I hope that uh, everyone will help him in uh, reviewing because we know how hard it is to, to get all these thousands of uh, papers and reviews in. Uh, so Roberto, I think uh, that's, uh, that's all I have to say. And now uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here, so I'm so happy. And uh, uh, it's a pity that we have to do it online, but uh, at least uh, we're here. So thanks again. Um, so in this talk, uh, I'm, talk I'm, I'm dealing with uh, actually two of the three main tasks in natural language understanding. Um, namely uh, name, uh, semantic role labeling and semantic parsing, but specifically how to do, how to scale this, uh, these tasks multilingually. Um, so this is joint work with uh, uh, four um, among PhD students and postdocs, uh, Simone Coni, Andrea Di Fabio, Regina Bloschmi and Rocco Tripodi. Um, and I'll start uh, from with, uh, with an example. Uh, I like to give examples where machine translation doesn't work, but of course we could find many of these examples in all tasks. Uh, but I think these are interesting examples because they clarify how hard it is for a machine to understand um, con words in context and uh, disambiguate them and uh, process the information that is available uh, in text. Like uh, if we say something like I stood by the bank looking at the ships, we expect something like um, uh, a river bank. Uh, but actually uh, a machine translation system, state of the art, understands uh, a financial institution. And even if we give more context, we get the same result. So this is just one of the many examples that one could come up with um, uh, to realize uh, how hard it is to enable natural language understanding uh, for machines. And um, I think, I believe that there are three main tasks uh, to enable explicit natural language understanding. So some uh, kind of understanding which can be in a sense proven or shown as a um, hint that the machine uh, understood uh, the meaning of the text. The first one is word sensitive ambiguation. Um, I've been doing word sensitive ambiguation for almost 20 years now, uh, but I'm not talking about it today, uh, even though yesterday I gave a talk on uh, this, uh, this topic at the uh, uh, multi-word expression and uh, e-lexicography workshop at Colling. Um, 
And so the first one is word sentence ambiguation, where we have words in context, and we want the system to identify the most appropriate meanings for these words. Like for example, fire here is an ambiguous word and needs to be disambiguated. So we don't shoot at programmers if we want to fire them from a company. And so we have to choose the right meaning and the system has to do that. And normally you use a sense inventory uh, from which uh, the right sense of a given word has to be uh, chosen. The second task is semantic rule labeling, where we perform some kind of shallow semantic parsing, which uh, uh, annotates uh, the sentences at the predicate argument level. And so, for example, here we have an event that is uh, triggered by the verb fire. Um, and here we have a firing event. And we have some uh, roles uh, taken by some of the phrases or some of the words in the sentence, like we have an employer, an employee, a position, and so on. Uh, this is uh, the result of a uh, system that's been around for that, that's been around for some years. Um, now, no more state of the art, but uh, unfortunately, the system here chooses the wrong meaning of firing. And obviously, you don't do this for uh, uh, employees, as I said, but unfortunately, that's what the system understood to shoot projectiles at uh, um, uh, like the employer uh, sh is shooting projectiles uh, for a certain business. So this is really uh, not what we meant in our sentence. Uh, the third task is semantic parsing. So in semantic parsing, we aim at transforming text into a structured semantic representation. And so uh, rather than just working at the level of the interaction between the predicate and the roles played by the various words in, or, or phrases in the sentence, we transform the sentence into a structured representation that makes explicit the connections between uh, the various um, uh, lexical items or phrases in the sentence. Um, and so normally we produce a graph, um, which, re which represents the semantics of the text of the sentence, etc. So these three tasks, however, suffer from uh, some issues. Uh, one is the paucity of resources and training data in most languages. Uh, this is unfortunately a recurring uh, pervasive issues, issue in, uh, in natural language processing, but specifically in semantics, uh, both lexical and sentence level semantics, we have issues of this kind, that many resources and training data are available uh, either in English only or in a few uh, languages. And this results in big performance gaps, unfortunately. Uh, and also uh, another key issue that I find very challenging is the lack of shared semantics across languages. So what if we wanted to uh, create, to provide a representation that is independent of the language that is used to express uh, a certain uh, concept or set of concepts? And so uh, in this talk, I will uh, address these issues. Um, and as I said, I'll focus on SRL and semantic parsing the uh, second and third task that I introduced, uh, but I will not uh, talk about word sentence ambiguation, which is um, actually another key uh, problem, uh, especially if we want to scale multilingually. Uh, we have two papers that might be of interest uh, and that we uh, presented recently or are presenting next year uh, at AAAI about how to scale uh, word sentence ambiguation to many languages. One is about label propagation, the one presented each guy this year that actually will be presented in January because of the conference postponement. And um, uh, another one on uh, creating silver data for word sentence ambiguation that will, will be uh, published uh, soon as a preprint and presented at AAAI next year. So now um, I'm presenting here three different works combined into a single talk uh, that address the issue of how to scale uh, semantic role label and semantic parsing uh, to many languages and how to represent, to provide a representation for predicates and roles that is independent of the language. And this is a uh, verb atlas. Um, so I'll start from semantic role labeling. Um, very briefly, an overview, but I guess that uh, given uh, the work by uh, uh, Hajic uh, and uh, colleagues, um, I guess this is very well known, but uh, uh, very briefly for the, for the uh, sake of the uh, presentation, uh, let me introduce SRL. So this is the task of automatically determining who did what to whom, where, when, and how, ideally. 
And so if we have a sentence like the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, we want to identify uh, the predicate or the predicates that are expressed in the sentence. We want to disambiguate this predicate and choose the most relevant uh, meaning sense for this predicate. And normally we have to use a resource that provides all the possible meanings for this predicate. We want to identify the arguments uh, for uh, this predicate. And in this case, we're using spans, but we could use um, uh, the uh, dependencies to, to do that. So we could identify the uh, head of this uh, phrase like uh, uh, fox here or dog here or over and so on. Um, and finally, we want to classify the arguments uh, using uh, a set of uh, semantic roles. So in this case, for example, arg0 and arg2, if we know what these mean uh, uh, in the jump3 uh, predicate. Um, or, for example, if we want to give explicit meaning, we could say this is who and this is over what. So we have these four subtasks to perform in SRL. Um, now let's talk about the role of syntax in SRL. What are the advantages and disadvantages? Syntax can be a strong uh, indicator for many of these subtasks because we can use part of speech tagging and lemmatization um, and uh, syn syntax based rules. Um, dependency uh, neighbors and syntactic relations to help the various tasks, subtasks in SRL. However, there's also this advantage that uh, in order to perform these tasks like part of speech tagging or uh, syntactic analysis, we need to train systems, uh, currently neural architectures to uh, identify, to, to, to extract this information. And unfortunately, uh, creating, uh, performing annotations at the syntactic level is expensive. And it's not always the case that we can perform uh, with the best uh, uh, high standard uh, in, in many of these tasks. Uh, for example, for low resource languages, part of speech tagging performs uh, pretty well in, in English. But in many cases, for example, in, in Chinese, uh, we get performance that is slightly below 90%, which is good, but not excellent. Or uh, if we care about the uh, uh, labeling in syntactic parsing, um, the quality of the um, label attachment is not so uh, high if we care about uh, uh, the labels that are morphology aware. So, these uh, hints, these uh, cues that could be used for improving SRL might be um, might uh, help, but might also be problematic in some languages. So we uh, wanted to address this point and uh, try to find a solution with the current uh, developments in deep learning that um, avoid the use of syntax and part of speech uh, information to perform multilingual semantic role labeling, and particularly to reduce the gap in performance uh, that affects different languages compared to the English language. So if we, uh, for example, evaluate state-of-the-art SRL systems presented last year uh, on the uh, gold standard, on the Cornell 2009 gold standard for um, semantic role labeling, we see that the uh, error rate that we obtain in English is very far from, um, is much lower than the one that we uh, have with state-of-the-art systems in uh, many other languages, and that the uh, performance gap can be uh, up to uh, almost 11%. Uh, and on average, uh, sorry, um, the, um, yeah, so there's a, there's a gap of up to uh, 11%. And the average error rate is 15-16%, uh, uh, which is much higher than the one uh, that we get in English. And why is that? This is because uh, many of these languages, in a sense, are lower resource. So they don't have uh, as many uh, training uh, sentences and uh, suffer from uh, the uh, paucity of resources and uh, training data. So um, our question here was, is it possible to significantly close this gap and reduce this uh, performance gap between English and uh, low resource languages? And our answer is yes. 
And in order to reduce this gap, we don't need syntax, even though using syntax would further help, of course. Uh, however, we know that this is not always the case or not always possible. Um, and so this is work that we just presented at Calling, uh, co-authored by Simone Konya. Um, and um, the idea is to set a strong and robust uh, baseline for future innovations. So as I said, nothing prevents us from adding uh, syntactic information and further improving the results, but we wanted to show that it's possible to uh, perform SRL, um, multilingual SRL and reduce this performance gap without using syntactic information. So what's the method? Uh, it needs to be language agnostic because uh, otherwise we couldn't perform uh, SRL in many languages. And this is the uh, overall architecture. We have an input sentence and uh, at the input level, we don't use any uh, specific um, syn syntax specific feature. So we don't have syntactic features. We don't have information about predicate embeddings or predicate indicator flags as is commonly used in many other SRL systems. We uh, have a, uh, we represent the words uh, in latent form. And then we have a predicate aware, uh, a, a layer for uh, producing predicate aware word representations. So representations that uh, are aware of the predicate they have to uh, relate to. Then uh, we use this information to perform predicate identification to say this word is or is not a predicate and to, uh, if it's a predicate, to disambiguate the predicate according to the resource uh, probec or any other resource that we want to use as the predicate inventory. Uh, then we use this representation to um, perform argument identification and classification. And here we use, uh, we produce predicate specific argument representations. Um, here uh, we, uh, I'll go into details now, but uh, in this module, um, we produce representations that, uh, as I said, are aware of the predicate, but specifically of the sense of the predicate and the position of the predicate. Uh, while in this module here, um, the information, uh, uh, be, the, the, re the relationship between the predicate and the argument uh, is made explicit. Now let's go into uh, more details. Um, so this is the uh, part in which we uh, just uh, start from the sentence and um, produce, um, bring together the various uh, word pieces into a single representation. Uh, that produces a latent representation for the word that is contextualized using um, uh, transformer uh, uh, models like BERT, XLM, Roberta, basically. Uh, now that we have our representations, our latent representations for the various words, we move on to the next uh, layer, which is the predicate aware word representation layer. And so this module. Uh, takes each word and uh, uses basically a bile STM uh, to produce uh, a, um, a representation as output that, the, that of course depends on the, on the context, uh, which is then used to perform predicate identification and uh, based on the output of predicate identification also to perform predicate disambiguation. And so if it's uh, determined to be a predicate, then it's also disambiguated. Um, once we know uh, for each predicate that was uh, identified, for example, here we have two predicates in this example. So if once uh, the two predicates are identified for each of these predicates, for each of these predicates, we uh, perform, we move on to this uh, layer here. So we uh, work at the interface between the predicate and the argument. And uh, for each word given as input, we uh, provide uh, the predicate aware representation by concatenating each, rep each latent representation of a word in context with the predicate representation itself. So actually this should be blue because the case with the predicate is to concatenate the predicate with itself. While all the others are uh, concatenations of the predicate and the word in context. So these are two latent representations. And so as a result, we obtain a latent representation of a word of a potential argument um, aware of the predicate we're working with. 
this means that we have to repeat this for each and every predicate. So assuming we have two different predicates, we'll have uh, two separate evaluations in a, in a uh, all of course uh, aggregated into a single matrix in which we uh, concatenate uh, the different predicates uh, because we want two different predicate aware representations for a given each given word. As a result, uh, after a by LSTM, we uh, exploit each of these, uh, the resulting representations uh, to perform argument identification and classification. Um, and so this is uh, a, an architecture that uh, exploits uh, the uh, transformer and exploits by LSTMs to perform the four subtasks uh, in SRL. And uh, here we present an evaluation based on uh, um, dependency-based uh, English SRL, but we also have an evaluation on spam-based SRL that I don't have time to present uh, in this talk. Um, so we tried, uh, we, are, we, are, we tried different um, uh, ways to contextualize words. And actually we even used the ALMO to perform a comparison against BERT. So we used uh, uh, ELMO, we used uh, BERT, both uh, when frozen or fine-tuned to the task. And we also used uh, uh, XLM Roberta. Um, as you can see, um, our model uh, uh, improves over alternatives using the same uh, transformer uh, model. Um, and this is on, uh, 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 on English, uh, dependency-based SRL, um, and achieves uh, up to 92.4.6, uh, uh, depending on whether we use uh, BERT, uh, fine-tuned, or XLM Roberta uh, on the English SRL task, and this is F1 score. Um, so this is to show that it's not only the uh, uh, transformer model that helps, which clearly does, but also there's a further improvement, uh, which is uh, uh, the result of using uh, an all-in-one architecture uh, with uh, the various uh, features that I just presented. Uh, and now we move on to the uh, most interesting part, which is the multilingual and cross-lingual SRL uh, evaluation, where we um, compare against uh, Hey et al. Uh, 2019, which is the syntax aware state of the art before our system. Um, and so you can see here that uh, the best results uh, across the board uh, in various languages are achieved when uh, using uh, XLM, XLM Roberta. And that's because XLM Roberta is in inherently multilingual and uh, uh, has a large representation. Um, and so you can see that uh, when fine tuning, uh, you get uh, very high performances uh, in uh, all languages. And all of them are around, um, around or slightly below 90% F1 score. Uh, if we uh, perform a zero shot cross-lingual SRL experiment, um, which is only possible in uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish and Catalan because uh, the same predicate argument uh, uh, inventory is used in the two languages. Um, we train on Catalan and we test on Spanish or we train in Spanish and we test on Catalan. We see that uh, there are promising results uh, that are obviously below the ones obtained when trained in, training in the same language, but still above 80%. Um, so this is to show that uh, it's possible with the current uh, technology and uh, deep learning architectures to uh, achieve a higher, uh, to reduce the performance gap across languages uh, in SRL. If we now move on to semantic parsing, um, we have different issues to address. Um, we decided to use uh, AMR, abstract mean representation, because it's a common um, representation that is used for uh, semantic parsing. As you can see here, um, you have a sentence from the little prince, uh, the little prince clapped his hands, 
and you have a structured representation, a MR structured representation of the sentence where uh, predicates are uh, obtained uh, based on prop bank uh, as, as, done, as is done uh, in SRL, in, let's say at least in kernel uh, data sets uh, for SRL. And we have uh, relations uh, with the other uh, parts of the sentence. This is, uh, in this case, the prints and the hands, and also other relations between the various arguments. And so this, this is the representation we would like to produce. And it's easy, relatively easy to a certain extent to produce a, such a representation in English because there's quite a large uh, training data set for uh, AMR parsing in English. However, the question is, where, first, whether there is data to train a system and perform uh, semantic parsing, AMR semantic parsing in non-English languages. And second, whether we can use AMR itself in other languages. Uh, AMR is not exactly an interlingua because it's heavily biased towards English. There's also some work uh, talking about this, uh, this issue. And also it makes extensive use of prop bank frame sets with Probank is uh, uh, English based, even though there are other versions of Prob, other editions of Probank in other languages. Um, however, it's also true that AMR explicitly aims at abstracting away from syntactic idiosyncrasies. And also, it should be ideally agnostic about how the meanings is derived from uh, language, from uh, text. Um, so it's not an interlingua, but in a sense, it's close to uh, being an interlingua. And some guidelines uh, could be adjusted to cover cross-lingual aspects. Uh, for example, one could decide not to use prop bank for the predicates, but uh, to use other um, inventories, uh, predicate inventories and role sets uh, in other languages. Um, now, uh, what happens if we try to use AMR in uh, other languages? Uh, let's look at uh, again at this example. So if you translate this sentence uh, into Italian and Spanish, for example, we see that some uh, of the uh, obvious uh, words that we find in, in English, like his, for example, are not expressed in Italian or in, in Spanish. For example, his is not expressed, is implicit. We say uh, clapped the hands, basically and not his hands. And, and so this relationship between uh, hand and prince is uh, only implicit in the sentence. Or in Spanish, uh, we don't even have the explicit, even though principito is a small prince, this is all in a single uh, word. And so uh, this uh, small uh, modifier is not made explicit, or at least it's explicit uh, at the morphological level. And so it's harder to uh, in a sense, uh, make it explicit through a node, or at least we should do that in some way. While this is the uh, English representation. So um, we could use AMR as a proxy or as a, um, a proxy to an interlingua and um, ideally uh, assume that we can produce an English AMR for the uh, for sentences written in any language. And so uh, given these two sentences to produce the uh, English uh, representation, uh, AMR representation as the semantic uh, representation for these sentences. Obviously it's a, we have to accept this assumption, but it's something that uh, is better than um, not being able to uh, perform a semantic parsing in other languages, at least at this stage. Um, currently, in many cases, uh, there's the need to perform uh, explicit or implicit word to node AMR alignment uh, in English AMR parsers. Um, this is uh, hard to project across languages because of course these, uh, if as I showed earlier, uh, the, the, there are some nodes that are not alignable in other languages. And so this alignment issue uh, becomes complex if we uh, want to use the same representation, but we want to align it to translations to other sentences in other languages that don't use the same uh, syntactic um, structure or lexical or morphological structure. 
And also, as I said, there's no cross-lingual AMR data, or at least very little, only for testing. So uh, the, it, there's no clear way uh, how to uh, train a system to perform uh, the task that we just mentioned. So the task in which we have a sentence and we produce the uh, English AMR. And so we addressed this issue uh, in an EMLP uh, paper we presented uh, recently, uh, joint with Regina Bloshmi and uh, Rocco Tripodi. Uh, and uh, the idea uh, was to um, dispose of AMR alignments uh, and enable cross-lingual AMR using silver data. And so we presented two different ways uh, of uh, creating silver data for cross-lingual AMR. And then the paper also have, has interesting qualitative insights about how uh, our system called Excel AMR handles language divergences, but there's no time here because I also wanted to introduce verb atlas. And so I needed to squeeze only some of the results into this presentation. Um, so uh, I'll first give you a model overview. So we have, uh, various sentences which are uh, translations of the English sentence. Um, we perform, for a given sentence, we perform first a sec-to-sec -sec concept identification. So we just produce the set of concepts that will make up the uh, graph, the AMR graph to be produced. And then uh, we will use a biofine attention um, strategy to connect these concepts uh, with relations uh, that uh, will uh, create the uh, final graph. And so this is the architecture for the concept identification phase. So we have uh, a sentence in the language of interest. For example, this is Italian. And so we have uh, the little prince uh, clapped uh, the hands because uh, this, this is the article, so clapped would be the hands, literally. Um, and so we give this as input to a BioLSTM encoder. Um, then uh, on the other side, we have a, a decoder, which uh, produces the uh, set of uh, concepts that we want to be part of our AMR, uh, English AMR representation. So the decoder, starts with uh, an S and then has to produce all the possible uh, nodes of the graph without connecting them. Um, then we have a, we exploit the encoder. So once we uh, produce, uh, we, we give uh, as input this sentence, we uh, can create a context representation uh, using the encoder attention uh, to um, using an MLP layer to uh, obtain a distribution over the uh, output vocabulary. Um, at the same time, uh, for each uh, token uh, that is uh, produced uh, as output, we exploit. So this MLP is also informed by uh, the state, the, the um, state representation, the hidden state representation of the uh, token uh, of the token of the time step that we produced at a certain time step. So basically we exploit uh, a certain, the context representation together with the current uh, token uh, state representation uh, to uh, decide what the next token uh, will be, what the next token will be produced at the decoding uh, level. Uh, on this softmax layer here. And so we have a, an output vocabulary distribution here. However, this is not enough because in some cases uh, we need to decide that we want to copy the uh, token itself and not just to generate a new one. And so basically we uh, also use the very same information to uh, decide that we want to um, uh, to decide whether in, in a, at a specific time step we want to copy information or generate a, a, new, a new token. And then we combine this information to obtain the final distribution. So this is the uh, architecture for the concept identification part. Then for the uh, relation, um, instead for the um, 
relational identification part, we use a bifine attention to uh, similar to what is done also with uh, with dependency parsing to uh, determine the uh, which relations to produce between pairs of nodes and uh, which label to uh, to output. Um, and as I said, uh, this is for the architecture, but then we need to produce data for training that uh, gives us input a sentence in a certain language and uh, expects uh, to produce a certain representation in English, uh, in English AMR. And so we need to have a training data set that comes with, uh, for example, Italian sentences and English AMR representations. And so to do this, we use two different strategies. One is based on parallel sentences, so we need a parallel corpus. And so uh, the advantage is that we use gold translated sentences from a parallel corpus. The disadvantage is that we have silver parsed AMR graphs because we provide uh, these sentences, the English sentence as input to uh, our English based uh, AMR parser and we produce the uh, uh, AMR graph that we associate with all the sentences. The uh, other alternative is to use machine translated sentences in which the advantage, uh, actually this is the disadvantage, sorry. The disadvantage is that we have silver translated sentences and the advantage is that we have a gold standard AMR graphs because these come from uh, the uh, data set for which the association between uh, AMR graphs and uh, English sentences uh, was made manually. So uh, let's look at the first, uh, the first case, parallel sentences and silver AMR. So uh, we have a parallel corpus like this one. We have sentences that are parallel. We uh, parse the English uh, sentence and we associate the uh, gold translations with the uh, silver AMR, English AMR. This is the first case. In the second case, instead, we uh, have a gold AMR graph English AMR graph associated with the English sentence. And uh, we perform automatic translations of uh, the English uh, sentence into other languages. Uh, in order to avoid um, noise, we back translate uh, the sentences into English and then uh, use a filtering step uh, to see uh, how uh, the representation, whether the representation of the uh, target language sentence, the target language translation is closest to the uh, representation of the uh, original English sentence. So once we back translate, we want the back translation to be closest to uh, the original English sentence like this one. If it's not, we just remove this training item and we don't provide it as, as part of the training data set. Uh, and then we associate uh, the gold uh, AMR graph with the uh, uh, translated sentences. And so now we have two ways of producing uh, training data for cross-lingual AMR parsing. And uh, we test on uh, the AMR24 translations data, uh, data sets that was uh, provided by the Mountain Cohen in uh, four different languages, Chinese, German, Italian, Spanish. And we use um, as much F1 to uh, evaluate the performance. Uh, we used Europarl as the parallel corpus and AMR2 for the other approach in which we use gold uh, AMR graphs. And we also tried different variants of uh, uh, our system, uh, of our Excel uh, AMR um, architecture, in which we either use a zero shot setting, so uh, we train in English and test in any other language, or we um, go from the, we are language specific, so we train in one language and test in the same language, or we train in all languages and test in any uh, language of interest or we train in English plus the language of interest and test on the language of interest itself. And uh, here we report the best results. Um, and we can see that AMR Eager, which is the only cross-lingual AMR parser from the literature uh, that we, compare, we can compare with, uh, obtains um, 
results that are in many cases similar to our zero shot uh, performance or slightly better or better in Chinese, but normally lower than um, Excel AMR um, in which we use the uh, translation approach, uh, but also lower when we use the uh, parallel corpus approach. However, better results are used when we uh, translate uh, our corpus, but use gold AMR because uh, the gold AMR is what we want to produce while the input can be noisier. And so this is a normally better strategy. And so now um, I'm moving on to uh, the final part of the talk in which, uh, so now we have shown uh, what to do, how to scale uh, SRL and semantic parsing multilingually. Obviously much more work can be done. And one of these is how to provide a truly semantic representation that is independent or as independent as possible from the language we are working with. For example, with semantic parsing, we saw that the representation is unfortunately English specific because we're using prop bank, English prop bank, or in SRL, we're also using prop bank. So, or, or even if you use another uh, representation, uh, another predicate inventory, we have the issue that uh, these inventories don't talk to each other and, um, uh, or there's a lack of multilingual data. Uh, and so each of these tasks suffer from a different issue. But in general, we have this issue that there's no way to provide a language independent semantics. So to address this issue, we first analyze the uh, resources that are available for predicate argument representation, and particularly for SRL. But these are, as I said, also used for semantic parsing. So the three main resources that are around are FrameNet, VerbNet, and PropBank. Um, both FrameNet and VerbNet suffer from incomplete coverage. So they don't cover the whole set of possible predicates or frames that can be expressed in, for example, in English. This makes it hard to create a general purpose system. Uh, PropBank and FrameNet suffer from, uh, in a sense, or at least have the feature of providing uh, predicate specific role semantics. So the roles are, have to be interpreted in, in the context of the uh, given predicate or frame. And so, uh, which is something that is not true for VerbNet because the roles in VerbNet are independent of the predicate. Um, PropBank and VerbNet uh, have, uh, make, make it hard to transfer information across predicates because the predicates are in a sense, uh, coarse grained senses of verbs. And so there's no easy way to um, generalize uh, to a certain frame as instead is done in FrameNet where all the verbs that have to do with a certain scenario are clustered together. And finally, all these resources are tied to specific languages, mostly English, but there are many other alternatives in other languages. However, it's a quite heterogeneous scenario. And so we, uh, last year at the MNLP, we introduced a new resource called uh, Verb Atlas, uh, joint work with Andrea Di Fabio and Simone Conia. Um, and so what we did was uh, relatively simple yet effective. So we manually clustered all the WordNet verbal synsets into frames. Um, as a result of this, we could bring together all those uh, synsets that have similar scenes and participants to a given action. So for example, the frame of eat bite uh, includes all the synsets that contain uh, action, that express actions of different kinds of eating or biking. Uh, or another frame, the frame of cooking includes all the kinds of cooking. And so all the types of frame net, of, of uh, WordNet synsets that have to do with this frame. Uh, also, we had to do something about the roles. We wanted uh, cross frame roles. So roles that have a semantics that is independent of the specific predicate. So we decided to go for VerbNet roles, but we reduced the set of roles to uh, about 25 roles uh, and um, reconducted those uh, the excluded uh, roles to the, the existing ones because many of them could be aggregated with uh, 
the, the ones that we selected. And so now we have a, a relatively small set of roles and a small set of frames. Um, so we have a frame level organization. Uh, in, uh, the role set, as I said, is inspired by VerbNet. And for example, in the eat byte frame, only some of these roles are activated, of course, uh, like agent, patient, and location, but not uh, instrument or, well, instrument could be activated, but we, you know, result of source and others. Or cooking, uh, for example, you have an agent, a patient, an instrument, a result, but you don't have a source, for example. Um, so now let me compare uh, Verbatas to FrameNet, uh, VerbNet, and PropBank. Um, and I think this comparison is easier if we go through uh, um, examples. Um, for example, here the cat swiftly ate the fish and the cook baked the cake uh, are, uh, uh, let's say, the semantics is identified by the uh, uh, main predicate, eating and baking. And so these are two different frames in uh, Verbatlas, cooking and eating bite. And the same for FrameNet where you have different frames, but the role is the same. The role of the cook and the cat is still the agent, while in FrameNet you have different roles. And same for patient here. So the food and the ingestible are patients. Um, or comparing to VerbNet, you have the issue that uh, while the frame, the roles are comparable because we use the same uh, subset of, of VerbNet's uh, roles. Um, we have the issue that I mentioned that the um, uh, frames are, in a sense, the, the uh, clusters in VerbNet are a bit less expressive because they are uh, based on a syntactic uh, basis, while uh, the frames in Verbatas are based on a semantic basis. So Concord and Nourish uh, nourishes uh, are semantically totally different. And so they, they belong to different frames. Uh, compared to PropBank, you have the advantage of having informative role labels. In PropBank, you have ARG0, ARG1, which as I said, are specific to the predicate sense, which is eat one and smell one in these two examples. While here you have the uh, 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 agent, patient, stimulus, and experiencer, which are cross-frame and uh, understandable independently of the frame. Some statistics. Uh, these are in comparison with the various resources. So you have full coverage of verbal meanings, which is something that uh, addresses the issue of, for example, FrameNet and VerbNet, uh, because we are we clustered all the verbal synthets in WordNet. Uh, you have coarse frames, so we only have less than 500 frames uh, compared to a large number of verbs in PropBank and uh, a, a, a higher number of frames in FrameNet anyway, even though they don't have full coverage. And the, argument, the set of argument rules is uh, uh, compact, so you only have 25. It's true that in PropBank you only have six proto roles. But it's also true that ARG0, ARG1, ARG2 are not so meaningful. So this is another advantage uh, over PropBank that we took from VerbNet, as I said. Um, Verbatlas is also linked to uh, WordNet and uh, BubbleNet. And that's uh, an inherent because Verbatlas is a set of frames that cluster WordNet synsets. And because WordNet synsets are part of BubbleNet, they are um, included, they are linked to Verbatlas. Um, but we also provide the link, linkage to PropBank because um, each uh, PropBank predicate that occurs in Cornell is, uh, has been linked to uh, a Verbatlas frame. As a result, we can train with, you can train with Cornell uh, converted to Verbatlas frames, which is something that we did, but I don't have time to present here. This is an easy example with uh, multilinguality enabled by Verbatlas and BabelNet, because if you uh, take different sentences, which are one the translation of the others, uh, you have, uh, in this case, the same scene set across languages, smelling, you have, or near synonyms, um, you have the same frame, even if you use near synonyms or other scene sets that belong to the same frame, it doesn't matter because all these uh, verbs here express the same semantic frame, which is independent of the language. 
and the arguments are the same because these are semantic arguments, semantic roles that are independent of the language. And so the experiencer and the stimulus don't depend on the specific language prop bank or resource because they are uh, language independent. And so in conclusion, uh, I could present quickly, I'm sorry, but at least I hope uh, thoroughly as much as possible, three different approaches to enabling multilinguality in uh, uh, natural language understanding. And so we reduce the gap uh, in, uh, uh, from English to any other language in SRL with a uh, uh, full-fledged uh, neural architecture um, with state-of-the-art in six languages, uh, robust in uh, low resource settings. Um, we uh, proposed uh, two different ways to produce uh, silver data that uh, improve the performance in cross-lingual semantic parsing. And we obtained a state of the art in uh, uh, five languages, five non English languages from, sorry, uh, in English plus four non English languages like Italian, Spanish, German, and Chinese. Um, as future work, we would like to um, integrate uh, resources like BubbleNet into the uh, process of creating AMR uh, representations. And finally, I also put forward a resource that is available online and can also be downloaded and used uh, to uh, represent uh, frames uh, in a way that is independent of the language and therefore scaling predicate resources and raw uh, representations across languages. And also thanks to linkage to existing resources like PropBank and BabelNet and WordNet, you can use any training data that is around with uh, uh, Verb Atlas. So uh, in the future, we would like to scale multilingually. A spoiler is that uh, this week, if everything goes well, we would like to release a new version of BabelNet. So you will see an announcement with 500 languages and 20 million synsets. So 4 million synsets more than the previous version and uh, double number of languages, more or less. Uh, and that is uh, more or less all. And I thank you for the attention. And uh, these are some links to our work. Thanks a lot. Well, just virtually, <laughs> thank you very much for it.